I got a few stories that I think you'll find interesting. Not necessarily paranormal in nature, but it's close to the realm of what you would call sea monsters. Anyway, I first started diving when I was about 18. I had just graduated high school, and I knew I wanted to make a career out of it. Little did I know, my diving adventures would take me across the Gulf Coast and give me some of the most horrific stories that I still remember to this day. I've done a lot of things in my life that were crazy, but these stories, they're different. They were crazy in a way that only someone who has experience in it would understand it. From there, I was taken to many offshore rigs and platforms once I got enough experience, some of which had been abandoned and forgotten. The conditions we worked in on some of these ops were far from ideal, but we also faced other dangers from nature itself, powerful currents, intense storms, and animals that you wouldn't think belonged out at sea. It's not surprising that our team consisted of what I considered some of the most experienced divers in the area. Many of us have stories about some crazy things we saw down below. Now, with that said, one of my very first jobs ever was working on an oil rig far off the coast of Florida. It was grueling work at times, but I loved being underwater, and hey, I was getting paid to do it. There were plenty of hazards associated with the job, like unpredictable weather and dangerous sharp machinery if you don't know what you're doing. On one particular dive, we came across something. I regret even working for that company. Now what followed were some of the most dangerous and extreme operations that I've ever been. It was common that I had to deal with leaking pipelines, hazardous chemicals, and on one occasion, unexploded bombs. One mission, myself and a team member were below the murky surface, working on a pipeline. We couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of us, so it was hard to tell what we'd come across. And suddenly, out of the darkness, something much larger than any shark that I've ever seen before came into view. We froze in fear as this creature circled us slowly. It was massive and looked like it had long, deep scars going down the length of its body. This shark was easily four times the size of any regular shark, like a great white or a tiger. Its back was a deep, inky black, covered in splotchy patches of white. Its eyes were piercing and sharp, and almost gave off a yellow-greenish glow in the murky waters and the lighting conditions. It had a broad, flat snout with rows of teeth and a wide, muscular gill plate. As it swam around us, we could feel the power of each stroke in the water and each movement of its massive body. It was unforgettable, to say the least. We watched in awe and terror for a few moments, before it seemed to have lost interest in us, disappearing back in the darkness. It seemed more curious than hungry, thankfully. We breathed a collective sigh of relief and continued that mission. This was roughly 400 feet below the surface. There was another mission I had years later with a very good buddy of mine. We were friends long before this op, though, we had to repair some heavy machinery at the bottom of a deep underwater canyon, and during the mission, my buddy got spooked by something large near him. He radioed me to come over and to help him, but when I got there, all he could tell me was that there was something big, black, and had these glowing yellow eyes that were surrounding him. I didn't know what it was, and we couldn't see it from where we were. After a few minutes, he said it slowly swam off, and he continued to do his work there. Apparently, it kept coming back, though, like it was curious to know what we were doing. 
those are just some specific ones that I don't like to talk about a whole lot. It creeps me out, and I can only imagine what else is down there on the ocean floor. Both experiences were terrifying, and I felt like at times I was being hunted by something. After all, we're stuck in complete and total darkness, unable to see more than a few feet in front of us. We had no idea what this thing was or what it wanted from us, other than us being a giant platter of food. Every movement we made seemed to attract its attention. To say it was a nerve-wracking experience is taking it lightly. After all these years, I'm still not sure if it was just a large fish or something else entirely. After the mission was complete, we were both relieved and happy to be back upon the surface. I am thankful for those days, but it did help shape me into who I am, and taught me many lessons about resilience, respect, and how to handle life. Alright, the third story. It didn't happen to me, but a colleague of mine whom I've known since the early 2000s. He was on a mission up north, in an undisclosed location, around where a military base, as I was told and was also one of the longest operations he had ever been a part of. He had worked for months trying to fix an oil pipe that had cracked due to unusually severe ocean conditions. That was one of the many projects he completed. When in particular, though, he had to dive down to about 170 meters to do some much-needed repairs. The area, I guess, was actually lit up with bright service lights. While working down there, he saw something that sent shivers up his spine and nearly shoot up to the surface. He tells me that he almost did not finish the job. Multiple times he explained that he saw the largest tentacles he'd ever seen before in his life moving below him and around him. He asked me if I'd ever seen the Pirates of the Caribbean, the one with the Kraken. I told him yes. He said that the tentacles were even bigger than that. The motion of them moving in the water alone would sometimes shoot him up in depth. He says he's never been more scared in his life than in those moments. He never found out what it was, and he's thankful he never did. He doesn't want to know, because whatever it is was far too large for him to ever want to know about. Even underwater with all this experience, there are some times you could still be taken aback. Whatever it must have been, if there was ever a creature worthy of the title Kraken, well, that was it. As experienced divers, we often take for granted how incredibly deep some of our missions take us. It is truly a remarkable place, full of wonders, darkness, and the unknown. But I think a lot of us do forget about all the things that lie down there. The things that are odd and mysterious, rejected by land and life. No matter what we face, though, I feel like we can always come back up safely and having learned something about ourselves. I'm sure you're no stranger to terrifying, large and harrowing fish found out at sea by fishermen just like many of the details you describe in your accounts listed on your channel. Well, I too have an interesting story about a very large, what I'll call an unknown fish. While I was cage diving with great white sharks off the coast of Mexico, many years back, around 2002. To be exact, I'll spare you all the boring details about going out there on the boat whom I was with getting suited up and getting into the cage, because that's pretty redundant. But anyway, great white shark diving is something that's amazing. If you ever get the chance to do it, it's quite an adrenaline thrill. In fact, I was loving it and having the time of my life. I'm not really what you'd call an adrenaline junkie or even a thrill seeker, but this was something that I had to cross off my bucket list, at least once. Anyway, here's where things get crazy. I'm in the cage, 
watching these beautiful and large majestic fish swim all around me, knowing I'm literally within 20 feet of a man-eating predator, as Hollywood portrays them to be. There's three of them swimming around me, and I noticed their sudden disinterest in swimming, if that makes any sense. They kind of start to trail off towards the other directions out into the open sea, and as I sat there confused, wondering why they're no longer swimming around me, I began to see that deep below me, underneath me, a very, very large shape was beginning to emerge closer to the surface. Now, at first, I assumed this might be a whale, but this shape, whatever it was, never fully surfaced enough that I could really make out vivid details. All I can really tell you is that it was very, very large, a dark shadow of something, and it seemed to be moving. Maybe it was a craft of some kind. It's hard to say. It looked very long, like if you were to take a sperm whale and enlarge it even more. I'm terrible at describing things, but the best way I can describe it is it was some large marine animal or fish or something that was much, much larger than any great white that I've ever seen. But again, I can't give you great details. It never fully surfaced enough, even in the water, that I could make out what it was. What I can only assume, looking back on the event, is that this thing approaching us made the great white sharks flee. Now you tell me, what's out there in the ocean that the sheer presence of a fish makes even great white sharks flee? So, that's something that's left for another day of mysteries. And I'm not kidding when I say that the shape of this thing was massive. It engulfed the entirety underneath my cage. And again, it was just a black mass. I couldn't tell what it was. But it seemed to go in front of me, below me and behind me for maybe only a moment or two before submerging back down to the depths to where I couldn't see it anymore. After that, the sharks stayed gone. Once I went back up to the boat, I didn't tell them what had happened. I only mentioned how the sharks just seemed to lose interest. That was it. It didn't really scare me as much as it makes me think about all the ancient mysteries that the ocean holds. I feel foolish for saying this, but I think I saw something that might have been out of place, whatever that means. I was at my grandfather's lake house, out in the woodland area of Louisiana, just last summer, and I had an encounter with some kind of creature, or I guess it would be a lake creature. I know that sounds crazy, like some sort of Hollywood movie plot, but I promise you, the truth is stranger than fiction. I couldn't fully understand or describe what it was. I'm hoping someone can help me identify what it might be. After doing some researching, I found your channel and saw you were doing a series about lake and sea creatures. Maybe one of your followers might be my ticket into getting a resolution to what I'm about to explain. My father and I go fishing a few times during the summer every year at the same lake where my grandfather's house is situated. This particular year was no different. It was just like any other trip this time. We got out our gear together, did our traditional cola pop chug, downing a can of soda in one big gulp, and rowed out into the lake. Normally, I will row around till Dad is satisfied that we have found the right spot, because Dad is a more experienced fisherman. He lets me go first, hooking my bait onto the hook, and casting it into the water. I just sat and wait. When Dad cast his pole, he got a bite almost immediately. And he pulls out a little three-inch trout, which would explain how he caught it so fast. You see, baby adolescent fish aren't smart enough to stay away from your bait, even though they know what it is, so they're easier to catch. 
we don't take our phones out on the boat, so I can't ever accurately judge what time it is, other than looking up at the sun and guessing by its location. I would say maybe 45 minutes went by after he caught his fish that I finally had a bite. It was definitely a fighter. After a lot of persistent pulling and leading, I finally started reeling it in. Just as I was about to take it out of the water, a larger fish grabbed it from me, hook and all, and took it away. I rehooked my line, throwing it back into the water. I don't know why, but larger fish always love taking my smaller bites. Luckily, I had another bite a little while later, and I was determined not to let this one get away from me. I let it lead around for a little while, before starting to reel it in hard. I waited long enough to see if it caught the fish off guard. Then, yanking hard, I started to reel it in, and as I was lifting it out of the water, I saw another fish trying to snag it from me. I yanked it out of the water quickly, but that didn't stop the other fish from jumping out of the water to bite it as I pulled it away. It wasn't much larger than the fish I pulled out of the water, yet it was definitely a predator. When it landed back in the water, oddly enough, it stared at me for a minute before swimming underneath. It was a pale blue fish with weird yellow and brown eyes. It didn't look like it had scales, but almost like it had skin. Thinking about it, I'm not quite sure it was a fish at all. Its head resembled a fish, but it didn't look like a fish that I had ever seen before. I told Dad that I had used the restroom. I rowed back to shore and thought to myself, I am done for the day. I didn't tell my dad what I had seen, but I think the lake and the heat were messing with my head. It was quite hot out there, and we had no shade. I think I just needed to lie down to get rid of the ominous headache that I had developed. We went out again the next day. I had chose a different spot in the lake for us, just in case whatever I'd seen yesterday happened to still be out there. It took a while for either of us to get a bite on our lines, and whatever happened to the fish must have happened overnight. I told my dad jokingly, we must have caught all the fish yesterday, and the lake was up for the summer. He laughed at me and said we should just find another spot after being in the same spot for the same two hours and not finding anything. It was considered bad luck. So... I rode over to a spot near the edge of the lake on the farther side of the lake that faces the woodlands. Not much activity was happening until my father got a fish. I don't know what he caught, but it was significantly large. He was losing his grip on the pole. When I helped him hold onto the pole and the fish came out of the water, it must have been a 16-inch fish. Okay, so not enormous, but... It was definitely better than a three-inch trout. But that's not what surprised me. What did surprise me was the gigantic bite that was taken out of the side of it. The reason it was so hard to reel in and felt so heavy, because we were fighting with something that was already eating it. We looked around in the water and could see those faint glowing yellow eyes. Then I realized... Perhaps it was the same thing from the other day. My dad actually kind of got spooked after that and decided we better call it a day. We rowed back to shore. We had to go to the store to buy something for dinner since we had not caught any fish that day except the half-eaten one that we had pulled out of the lake. Dad said he wasn't getting as much excitement out of fishing this year. I told him if tomorrow didn't go any better that I would be okay with heading home early. The next morning, I woke up early, went out to the lake to sit on the dock. I watched the water as the sun rose. I couldn't see any fish in the water from where I was. Normally, you come out there that early and it looks almost as if the whole lake is moving as the fish are swimming, creating an orchestra of colors. Not today, though. 
across the water to the spot where we'd struggled to catch the fish yesterday. I then saw a fawn coming out of the woods towards the edge of the water. I watched it as it stumbled across the ground, dipping its head to the water to drink from it. It was so peaceful, until something long and pale came out of the water, bit onto its neck, pulling it down into the depths of the murky water in a matter of seconds. I stood up, frantically looking around to see if the fawn got out of the water, but after several moments, I could only assume what had happened. I just sighed and went back inside. I walked into the kitchen to find Dad drinking his coffee. I didn't tell him what I saw happen to the fawn. I didn't tell him about the stillness of the lake, and there didn't appear to be any fish. There wasn't any reason for staying for another day of fishing. My father was greatly disappointed, but he knew I was right. When we had packed up all of our stuff and loaded onto our truck, I turned to look back at the lake one last time. And I swear, just like out of some sort of nightmare, I could faintly see glowing eyes staring at me from underneath the water just offshore. And then something far more horrifying happened in that very moment. We both heard some swishing around like something heavy was under the dock. That was when we saw the body, or should I say half-eaten body, of the dead fawn from earlier that morning floating out from underneath the dock into view. There really wasn't much left of it, other than a massive heap of torn up, eaten on flesh, and a leg or two, which was the only real way you could even discern it was still a fawn, or had been a fawn. It's safe to say that my father and I don't go fishing out there anymore. I want to share an experience I had in the Florida Everglades in 2021. It was early summer, and I was preparing my airboat to race in the yearly speed contest. I had just completed several test runs for speed along the Tam Miami Trail, reaching speeds of about 100 miles per hour. But I knew I could go faster. As a result, I came to a stop with the boat so that I could work on the engine and make sure that I had the proper mixture of fuel to achieve my maximum speed. That was when I heard it. The sound of an alligator coming from the swamp. The sound was so loud and menacing that it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. In all my time spent in the Everglades, I have seen and heard a great number of alligators, but I have never heard a bellow quite like this one. I could tell it was a large alligator just by the sound that it made. I saw it coming out from the tall grass. It was about a hundred feet away. It was unlike any gator I had ever seen before. It was massive, easily over twenty feet. Its body rose above the surface of the water. After that, it did something that was far more terrifying than anything I could have ever imagined. It stood up on its hind legs. It towered over the water at a height of more than 10 feet and was as tall as the pilot chair on my boat. I'm not sure how to fully describe it. It had a head that resembled an alligator only smaller. Its snout was not exceptionally long, yet its mouth was brimming full of teeth. The eyes were set back and large, with large pupils, black as coal. The front legs closely resembled the arms of a gorilla. They hung down, were full of muscles, and had hands with fingers. In addition, they had long claws that extended approximately four inches. I couldn't tell what the legs looked like because they were below the water, but I could see they were thick and muscular. This thing started to walk towards the boat. I knew I had to get out of there, and fast. But of course, my engine would not start. I became trapped. It turned to one side as if turning away from me, and I could see its back 
was like an alligator's, except it had these spikes that would stick out. As it turned back towards me, it brought both hands together, smacking the water, creating a wave that came at the boat, almost knocking it over. I thought about jumping overboard and swimming, but I realized I could not outswim this thing. So I sat there, frozen, not knowing what to do. I tried starting the engine again. This time it started. I revved it up and took off as fast as it would go. It only took me several seconds to reach 60 miles an hour. The beast swam through the water close behind. It wasn't until I reached the speed of about 80 that it started to fall behind. Yet, I could see that it was still following me. I wondered what beast could travel at that speed. It took several moments to get back to the launch ramp. As soon as I arrived, I immediately jumped from the boat, ran to my truck, grabbing my rifle. Looking back into the swamp, I could see the beast just lying offshore. I fired two shots directly at it. I know I hit it, but it didn't move. I was about to shoot again, but it very slowly went under the water. I couldn't see it anymore. I have since sold my boat, and I will never be going back into the Everglades. I used to enjoy watching my father fish when I was a young boy, and I suppose it was inevitable that I would follow in his footsteps as I got older. And that I did. I worked as a fisherman for 40 years, and I suppose the years drifted by quickly. And it's only now, at 87, that I pause to reflect on the past, and I feel now's the right time to come forward about an experience that I had at the age of 19. During the summer of 1952, two of my colleagues and I were on our boat off the Cornwall coast. We were looking to cast our rods to catch red salmon, as we were getting a handsome check for providing a local butcher with fish. It was a hot summer day, and we had a few beers with us on the boat. Our t-shirts were off. We were enjoying waving at a group of young ladies who were having a picnic on the coast. We didn't know the girls, but they beckoned us to come and join them for their picnic. It was certainly enticing for a 19-year-old. I'd been working as a fisherman's apprentice for around five years at that time. It was very rare that I ever encountered the opposite sex. The ladies beckoned us. The smell of their vanilla perfume seemed to gather and cluster on our boat. Their soft, feminine overtones were almost hypnotic, filling me with a youthful desire. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Well, what occurred on that day was nothing but sheer madness. Sheer terror. As I was waving to the girls, the others on board decided to jump overboard and swim towards the shoreline and walk up to meet the girls. I told them that it seemed like a good idea and encouraged them to go. No sooner had they jumped overboard then the sky became very gray, and it started to rain heavily. I watched as they struggled to swim against increasingly erratic waves. I caught a glimpse of the girls, and I could see them jumping up and running away. I started to wonder if I was missing something, or if it was some kind of trick girl's play, because it seemed like it was too good to be true. Maybe they were afraid of the impending rainstorm. Or perhaps they were hesitant to actually meet guys. The sky continued to pour, and I noticed that my friends were struggling very heavily. I witnessed a horror that made my hands shake with fright. A large serpentine creature shot up out from the ocean, long, over 15 feet, Huge body, green and oily, similar to a sea snake. It had fangs that looked to be a foot long, the size of its head 
that was protruding from its body was larger than a human's head. It was a disturbing sight, and just the memory alone terrifies me. The guys in the water noticed it too, and I noticed that it seemed to be hunting them. It lunged at one of my friends. I saw signs of blood in the water. I grabbed something nearby and threw it out in the direction which the serpent was now thrashing around, jumping in and weaving out of the ocean like a dolphin, but viciously with a clear intent to wound and kill. The creature then turned around, noticed me, and bolted towards my direction through the water. As soon as it was close enough, its enormous tail shot up out of the water and attempted to cut me in the face, but I managed to block it with an oar in the boat. It seemed like it was intent on striking me. It sprang about, thrashing and hungry for human flesh. I was absolutely petrified beyond belief. I had never witnessed such a creature before, and at only 19 years old, I was still a virgin of the sea. Even my own father had never heard of anything remotely similar to this or come across anything of the sort. The creature that resembled a serpent was able to climb aboard the boat, and it was now facing me head on. The boat capsized slightly. Sea water began pouring in, both at my feet quickly. It felt like I was going to die, but I knew I would not give up without a fight. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was going to lose. I continued kicking frantically, hoping that if it made contact, it would retreat in fear. But this thing looked just as vicious as it did hungry. I managed to hit it slightly with the oar. The problem was that the boat was now almost completely submerged. Instantaneously, the storm had been raging overhead, ended all of a sudden, and this serpent-like creature dove back down into the water. The sea became calm and still, and I now felt safe to swim to shore. By the time I got there, my friends were nowhere to be seen. I found them later, they were still bleeding from the deep wounds and cuts from where this creature had attacked them. When we told other people about our experience, no one believed us. However, a biologist said it was possible that it could have been a mysterious underwater serpent that had not yet been discovered. Whatever it was, it was terrifying, and I was glad to have never encountered it again in all the years I spent fishing. Look, I know this might sound outlandish, but this is a story that happened when I was younger. I haven't experienced anything like it since. I know there are crazy tales of sea experiences out there, and, well, this is mine. Just remember that almost every fisherman out there has his or her own story to tell. Let me introduce myself. You can call me David. I am a primary school teacher from Northern Ireland. I came across your channel very recently. I would like to share an experience that has been disturbing and wreaking havoc on my mental health. I've taken a leave of absence from teaching over the past year. I have concluded that I don't believe I'll be able to return to work anytime soon. And it's not just because of COVID. It is about an encounter during the summer of 2018 with something in the ocean that, to this day, I still can't explain. At the end of each school year, the teachers of the 7th grade at the primary school take their students on a field trip to a coastal resort. It's all to wish them farewell before they enter secondary school. The weekend is always memorable. It's packed with many activities and fun. The children, mostly 11 years old, really enjoy doing it. And so do the teachers. Over the past decade, I've looked forward to the annual trip, and I've done so with great pleasure. Yet in 2018, that all changed. I was the designated teacher for a group of five children. 
It was my job to take them out in the ocean for a short canoeing excursion. This was just off the coast of Cork. And to say it was picturesque would be a complete understatement. I remember thinking how lucky I was to be Irish, and how blessed I was to have a job allowing me such a beautiful spot, and to get paid for it all at the same time. We all went out on the water in our canoes, everybody wearing their life jackets for safety. In addition, we all carried whistles with us, just in case of any difficulty. Canoeing was not a new experience for most children. Some had a natural talent for it. But one child on the autism spectrum was high-functioning, but had poor hand-eye coordination and struggled to use his oar. I had to help him and spend a little extra time showing him the technique. He eventually got the hang of it, so we all adjusted our speed to accommodate him. There was a small sandbar, about one quarter mile from the shore, which was the destination we had in mind for our planned pit stop, for a snack, and before heading back to the beach. I had some fruit, biscuits, and juice, all of which were stored in the backpack I had brought along. To guarantee that the children would have adequate energy and to be physically prepared to row the canoe trip back to shore. Reaching the sandbar at low tide allowed the children to explore and collect seashells. After having the snacks, it was time to head back to the beach before high tide would come in. Once in the water, though, the currents became strong. The waves began to make the canoes shaky, and some children said they were struggling to row. It was a bit worrying, but I could see that they weren't far from reaching the shore. Dennis, the child with autism, began to really struggle. First, his oar fell into the water and sank. Then he began to panic. He kept trying to stand up in the canoe, which caused it to rock back and forth violently. I could see the kids in the other canoes becoming scared. I told the others to go ahead and rode ashore as I was going to tie a rope onto Dennis's canoe and pull him with me. When I reached him, I noticed something large and green, like the shape of a cobweb, but just under the water. I squinted to see better from the sun's reflection off the water. Looking downwards, I brushed it off as some weird type of seaweed or something. As soon as I tied it around Dennis's boat, I saw this thing circling. It also seemed to pulsate, getting bigger and then smaller again. I just hoped it wasn't a jellyfish or some dangerous sea animal. At the moment, the motion of the water abruptly ceased. I turned around to check on the other children and ensure they were all safely on land. As I turned my attention back to Dennis, a snake that had looked like a serpent leapt out of the water and bit the top of my head. Blood ran down my face due to the large fangs cutting into my skin. In that moment, I felt like I was going to die. I yelled at Dennis to get in my boat, but he was panicking. This thing kept exploding out of the water as quickly as lightning, each time trying to attack my head in an attempt to bite. It was the most frightening experience. I was being attacked while on the water with a very vulnerable child. On top of that, I had never before encountered a marine creature that was so hostile. After being bitten, I could feel the skin on my forehead spreading out without a doubt, as a result of a reaction to the venom that was released from this bite. This snake, or whatever it was, was not very big. It was probably the size of a typical rattlesnake. It was enough to, nevertheless, act aggressive. In addition, I had no idea how poisonous it might have been. I've read that sea snakes have a particularly potent venom, I let out a sigh and a curse. I got Dennis's boat and started paddling like hell. This creature shot up again. 
Its eyes were like slits, yellow and soulless. I did the best I could to try and avoid it, but to no avail. It bit again. The canoe boat shook and almost nearly capsized with the impact. Eventually, we reached the shore. As I lifted Dennis out of the canoe, he was dripping in cold sweat. The remaining children came running over and gave us hugs. They had seen it all and were traumatized and scared. All of them were pale from shock and required immediate assistance obtaining water and food. We called an ambulance and explained the situation to the dispatcher. I received medical attention and had my wounds dressed. The venom, fortunately, did not prove to be fatal. But I must confess that the memory of that event has remained in my consciousness ever since it occurred. It seems like every instant of every day, I am reminded of the anxiety and fear I experienced while in that canoe. I fought for my life, not just mine, but for the little kids entrusted to my care. I sincerely feel I will never go back in that canoe again, and I am reluctant to even go near the water. The last I heard of the kids, their parents had taken them out of public school, and they were being homeschooled for the time being, and poor Dennis had completely retreated into himself. Obviously, what we saw had a scary effect on all of us. In sharing this experience on your program, I hope you can enlighten me and inform me if other such creatures exist and have been sighted by others in the sea. I am aware it was some sort of sea serpent, nothing crazy like Leviathan or anything. But I've never run into a sea serpent so aggressive. I mean, this thing was intent on bringing me down so much so that I almost capsized our canoe. I would like to thank you for all your hard work. It is genuinely appreciated. As a former member of the United States Navy, I have experienced many strange and unexplainable things in the course of my duty. But one sighting stands out above all the others, a sighting that has left me with more questions than answers. It was a fairly typical day out at sea. We were anchored in the ocean, waiting for further instructions. It was my job to scan the horizon, but my attention was drawn to a shape in the water that seemed to slowly be moving toward us. At first I panicked, thinking it might be an enemy submarine. But as it got closer, this wasn't that at all. For hours I would watch this shape trying to make sense of what I was seeing. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen in all my years with the Navy. It had this strange green-gray metallic sheen to it and was at least 100 feet in length. But what really caught my attention, what really bothered me, was the fact that it did not show up at all on our sonar equipment. I monitored the situation logging every detail in my logbook, including time, date, location. I knew this could be something important. I wanted to make sure that I had all the information I could get. As I watched this shape move across the water, I felt this sense of unease, that there was just something about the way it was that told me it was unnatural. The fact that it wasn't showing up on our sonar added to the mystery. Now, I've seen some strange things being in the ocean, but this was different. It was like some sort of device or craft out of a science fiction movie. I could not shake the feeling that we were dealing with something beyond our understanding, at least in a technological sense. The hours wore on, and I continued to keep an eye on the shape, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. But no matter how hard I tried or to rationalize it, I couldn't come up with an explanation. Then, it finally disappeared beneath the waves, right around evening. I was left with more questions than answers. In the days that followed, I spent time discussing this with my fellow crew. We all had our theories, but nobody could really offer a solid explanation. 
others were very bothered by this. For me, it was a reminder that there are still things out there that we have yet to be uncovered. Navy life, after all, can be tough. Long hours, demanding duties. But if you stick with it, it's also an incredibly rewarding experience, camaraderie, and a very fulfilling sense of purpose. Being a part of the Navy, I always felt like I was a part of something bigger than myself, something that was working to make the world a better place. Now, during all of this, I couldn't help but notice that there was a strange tension among the higher-ups on the ship. Whenever the topic came up, they would quickly change the subject or act as if they did not wish to discuss it at all. It was almost like there was some sort of conspiracy going on, dare I say. And the more I pondered it, the more convinced I became that there was something they weren't telling us. I tried to do digging and talking to other members of our crew, trying to get more information, but no one really had anything. Many of my fellow crew also shared suspicions. I mean, we all had our own theories. Some assumed that it was a secret government project. Others believed it was an extraterrestrial craft. No matter what we thought, it was clear that there was a concerted effort to keep the sighting under wraps. The captain and other higher-ranking officers were all being unusually weird and tight-lipped about the entire thing. It was starting to feel like we were a part of Roswell or some sort of strange cover-up. Rumors began to circulate more and more from a few friends of mine that apparently a piece of a craft had actually been spotted in the water. Some claimed that it was studied in a secret underground laboratory, while others believed that it had actually been claimed and was taken to another facility for analysis. Now that's just word of mouth, I don't know. I know there's not a whole lot to this story, but looking back, it really does make me wonder what it could have been. Perhaps it was an experimental ship. Perhaps the Navy was testing something that we were not allowed to know about. We'll never know. I've been fishing in these Georgia waters for over 50 years now. I've seen things that most folks would never believe. But there's one story that sticks with me. One experience I still can't explain to this day. It happened back in 92, a few years before I retired from the fishing business. I was out on my personal boat, the Miss Betty, just off the coast of Savannah. I saw something in the water that stopped me in my tracks. It was well below the surface, a bright light like nothing I'd ever seen before, and it was moving underneath the water, through the waves and the current, like it was alive. It didn't really have much of a shape, other than a large, round ball of light, if that makes sense. I realized there was something extremely strange going on. I knew I had to keep my eyes open, if I wanted to get to the bottom of it. You see... I was born and raised in these parts. I've been fishing since I was old enough to hold a rod. My daddy was a fisherman too. He taught me everything I knew about the sea. When I was a boy, we used to spend long, lazy days out on the water, pulling in all kinds of fish and telling stories about the big ones that got away. But as I got older, I started to notice that things were changing. The sea didn't appear to be as bountiful as it used to be. There were days where it felt like we were lucky to catch anything at all. And I wondered if there was something going on. Something beyond my understanding. Now, that's a separate thought from what actually happened. Now, this light that I had saw, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was this bright, pulsating glow and it seemed to be coming from deeper and deeper. Now, I watched it in awe from the side of my boat as it began to pulsate and grow brighter and brighter. At times, it was almost blinding. I remember feeling a sense of unease wash over me, 
like I was witnessing something that I wasn't supposed to see. But even as my heart started to race, I couldn't tear my eyes away. It was like it was drawing me in, beckoning to me, trying to communicate something to me that I couldn't quite understand. I'm serious when I say that it had some sort of hold over me. The pulsating light began to rise up from the water, and I could see that the shape was far more massive than I could have thought, something that was now at least 50 feet below the surface. It stopped, and I could feel what I would describe as waves of electricity coursing through my body, like I was standing near a lightning bolt. Then there was this deafening boom, but it was extremely muffled, like 1,000 cannons firing all at once, but underwater. There was a shockwave, though, and it knocked me off my feet and sent the Miss Betty rocking from side to side violently. I remember thinking that this was it. This was the end. This was a submarine. That whatever was causing this light was going to blow me and my ship up. But just as suddenly as it had appeared, the light completely vanished. Only darkness and quiet remained. After the light disappeared and the loud shockwave boom, I was suddenly overcome by the most intense wave of nausea and dizziness I ever had. I nearly fell off the boat. It was like the very air around me had turned into fire. My lungs were burning. I couldn't breathe. The air was toxic. My head was spinning and my vision was blurred. I began to bleed out my mouth, my nose, my ears and eyes. I staggered to the side of the boat, retching blood, feeling like my insides were trying to escape. For a moment, I was convinced I was going to die all alone out here at sea. But somehow, I managed to stay conscious, clinging to the side of the boat as the world around me spun and whirled. This went on for probably 15 to 20 minutes. It was like I was caught in the grip of some kind of horrible unearthly force, something beyond my comprehension. With every ounce of strength I had left, I managed to get the Miss Betty moving toward shore. It felt like every wave was trying to knock me back, like the sea itself was angry at me for seeing something that I was not meant to see. Now I want to note here that while coming out here, the sea was relatively calm, and within a matter of no more than 30 minutes after that loud shockwave underwater, the sea had erupted in violence hard waves like a storm crashing against me. Even the wind picked up. There was no rain, though. As I neared the shore, I felt a sudden and intense feeling of dread, like if I didn't get back to land, I was going to perish at sea. It was like the ocean was wanting to claim me, to drag me down into its depths and never let me go. But I pushed the feeling aside, telling myself that I was just imagining things, that the light had just been a trick of the sea. Now, once I got back on land, the weeks that followed that strange encounter were some of the worst of my life. I was honestly convinced I had developed a terminal cancer. I was plagued by dizzy spells and fainting fits. My body would randomly show strange, painful burns that I couldn't explain. It was like this light had left its mark on me, like it was trying to tell me something I did not want to hear. At night, I would lie awake, staring up at the ceiling, trying to make sense of what happened, all while writhing in agony of pain. I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. I began hallucinating, hearing things that weren't there, seeing strange shapes that weren't there. I felt like my reality was being pulled in two different directions. Doctors could not find out what was wrong with me, but I'll get to that in a moment. On one hand, I wanted to forget the whole thing, to push it to the back of my mind and pretend like it never happened. But on the other hand, 
I knew deep down that something inside me had changed. Like, after seeing something that couldn't be explained away, that my interior makeup was different. Now, the day that I did go to see doctors, the first one took one look at me and was telling me he was convinced that I had been exposed to high levels of radiation, judging by my condition and the symptoms that I had. He could not explain the burns or the dizzy spells, but he was sure that they were a result of some kind of radiation poisoning. Perhaps I was out on the ocean where there were high amounts of toxic waste being dumped. Of course, I never told any of the doctors what I actually saw. That would have been a one-way ticket to the kooky bin. I remember feeling a mix of relief and fear at his diagnosis, though. On one hand, it was a relief to have some kind of explanation, but on the other, it confirmed my worst fears, that there truly was something out there, something beyond my understanding, that I didn't just hallucinate the whole thing, something capable of doing this. Now, recently, I've heard a lot of claims about UFOs being spotted underwater, but I try to remain skeptical. I mean, nowadays, it's easy to get caught up in conspiracy theories and speculation, but I can't defy what I saw. It's something that doesn't make sense, something I can't explain away as a natural phenomenon or a trick of lights and shadows. I don't know what it was, though. I don't know where it came from or why it was there. It honestly scares me more than anything else. It's like there's this whole other world out there that we know nothing about. A world far beyond our understanding. And who knows what else is out there, waiting for us to discover it. I'll know that I'll never forget that evening. I feel like it's always going to be a part of me, whether I want it to be or not. Anyway, this old man will stop ranting for now. Thank you for hearing me. 2005. I was in Hawaii on a snorkeling trip, and I had the time of my life with my family. The water was crystal clear, and there were plenty of exotic fish to admire. The sun was beating down on the ocean, and its crystal clear water sparkled as I slipped into the cool depths, feeling at home with all of the vibrant, beautiful tropical life around me. Colorful coral stretched along the bottom of the sea, and the fish everywhere were fitting around to explore. It felt amazing to be a part of this underwater world. I quickly forgot any fears that had been creeping up inside of me. Above me, there was a never-ending blue sky, dotted with puffs of white clouds, lazily drifting by. Rays of sunshine streamed through the surface water, making it shimmer like diamonds. The serene atmosphere was perfect. Now, I soon realized, however, that my experience had come to an abrupt end. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a large shape moving out of the reef ahead, by maybe 40 feet. I quickly scanned the surroundings, desperately searching for what it could be. My first thought was that I was just seeing things, that this was just a rock formation. But it moved. I became certain that this wasn't a rock formation, but a living thing. As it moved, I assured myself. Its body was covered in these black spines, and it moved with an incredible speed. Panic filled my chest as I realized this wasn't an octopus, but an octopus or a squid-like animal. My heart raced as fear paralyzed me in place while watching this thing. It moved so quickly and boldly. This thing had now reached a small patch of coral just ahead of me, and suddenly... Its body shifted in direction as it seemed to vanish in midair, emitting this loud, ear-piercing sound that physically stunned me. I know, not much of a sea monster tale, but whatever 
sound it made actually caused me to have heart problems. A bizarre and strange correlation to draw, I know. Prior to this, I've never had anything wrong with my heart. After I got out of the water, I told a few what I saw, which they thought was interesting. The octopus, or squid, wasn't huge, maybe seven foot in length and maybe a few feet in height, if I had to guess. I'll never forget those black spines on it, though. And the sound that it emitted felt more like a wave of energy going through my body. The same kind of energy you feel on the impact of a car crash. A sonic boom is what I think some call it. For the next couple of days, I actually had pretty bad heart problems, like shortness of breath, extreme chest pains to name a couple. Long story short, it turns out I had heart damage. I'll save all the other medical issues, and I can't say for sure it's the exact cause, but the timing is certainly unquestionable. Whatever it was has me respecting things down in the water just a little bit more. 